because this is uh, a two hour workshop, which is uh, gonna get, uh, give us enough time to go in depth, but also give you time to participate. Um, so if you have any questions while I'm speaking, please put them in the chat. Uh, and then in the second section, uh, we're going to go over different examples, and I'd really like to get your ideas, uh, what do you think about these examples, as well as if any of you are working on projects uh, and would like to get my opinion, the group's opinion about them and how to build an experience that is healthy, that will be the time to do that. Um, so I am going to jump into screen share. Okay, present. People are getting thumbs up if you see a screen uh, that's all sparkly and says building XR future. Great. So I'm Sarah Haskis. Um, a little bit about me just so you know uh, why uh, you're listening to me. Um, so around six, five, five, six years ago, I opened the first uh, VR lab in my university. Um, funnily, funny enough, they had a VR headset, but it was in a box, right? Universities are very funny that way. They have budgets, but nobody's really progressing with technology sometimes. Um, so I opened a VR lab in the motor control department. I was studying in the Netherlands, and I focused my research on uh, VR's effect on our brain and body, and can we use VR to teach ourselves movements in a more effective way. Uh, currently, I'm CEO of Radix Motion. We're a small startup, and we're combining uh, my research with immersive technology, both virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, and um, I'm going to uh, show you one of the projects we're building as a use case uh, towards uh, the middle of the section. So let's start with uh, uh, one of the biggest problems I see today with, with our um, gen general population. Uh, uh, Sarah, our, yeah. Sarah, there, there are some parts uh, being blocked by uh, gray box. Uh, did you see it? Gray box. Yeah, like no. the vertical gray box and then the horizontal one, like pretty much covered. Blocking text. Yeah, blocking all the text. Like there are some stuff maybe on your screen. You probably need There's, to. The only thing on my screen is also the Zoom thing. Oh, the Zoom thing, maybe you probably blocking. need to kind of, yeah, kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah disappear better? some. Yeah, better maybe dra drag it down. To button. So now I don't even see my Zoom. Oh, yeah, because I think that thing will become a gray box and cover your entire piece. Like, if part you of can it. see my, my screen, I'm sharing a picture for screen right now. Okay, let's try to stop the share and restart it again. This is interesting. Um, I can try again optimizing for a shared video clip. Is this better uh, still cover like the the left part still cover half left. of the text yeah that one Testing. okay zoom is very weird how about this better yeah. better better okay thanks for letting me know yeah thank you um Okay, so yeah, the problem with our current use system of technology, except for the fact that nothing makes sense, um, is that it isn't aligned with what our body needs. So uh, let's start a little bit with what our, our body does need. Um, so our body needs to really move and it needs to do it a lot. Sitting in front of chairs and desks all day is really, really unhealthy for our bodies. And just to put a little bit of some amount of numbers uh, on this, uh, the cost per, per employee in the United States due to back pain is around $444 a year. Um, the levels of obesity in the United States have increased to 42%. Both these things are very correlated to how much we don't move. So that's a huge problem right now. Um, the second pro thing that we need as humans is to feel connected. Now, social media is actually correlated uh, with depression, anxiety, and psychological distress. You can see, um, except for YouTube, which isn't exactly a social network, it's more of right, a platform where creators uh, showcase their creation, the classic social media platforms are rated here by how negative of an effect they have on people. So 
strangely enough, we're seeing that while digital connectivity is growing, so is loneliness. There's really something very strange happening here. We have more connections than ever before, but anxiety and depression are growing. So what's going on? Why is this technology not being healthy for us? Um, and this is where the neuroscience perspective comes in. Now, what our brain actually needs to build a connection is physical mimicry. We see this from the way a child connects to a parent. They're constantly looking at them and copying them. And there's this feedback loop that happens. The parents start mimicking the child too, uh, even in their facial expressions when they talk. Um, you see this in the games children play, right? Things like Simon Says and um, I don't even know, patty, patty Cake, I think, right? These very simple games that are all about mimicry. And without this mimicry, this physical uh, uh, ability to copy each other, we're losing that basic connection and th that basic um, ability to feel empathy to towards each other. So um, it's not all bad because uh, of the lecture we're, we're here to learn about because of XR. Because XR is the first time we have a technology that can actually enable us to start uh, being in 3D to start mimicking each other in 3D and bringing back that uh, 3D empathetic connection. Um, so that's what uh, I'm really excited about and that's why I decided to really focus um, my career into this technology. Um, now let's take a step back. So we know XR offers us hope uh, because we can use it to actually create empathetic connections with each other uh, and, and move our bodies. Um, but I wanna take you, you, because we have a lot of time, let's talk a little bit more about actually brains and what do brains do. So a brain really does not have any access to the outside world. Um, it's this processing thing that's stuck inside of our skull. Uh, we have a brain blood barrier there's no actual direct information that's coming from the brain to the brain. It's always going to our senses, going onto our spinal cord and to our thalamus, and then goes uh, to higher levels in the brain's cortex. Now, the theory I want to talk to you about is called the predictive coding theory. And this theory looks at the brain as the prediction machine. The brain is con constantly trying to guess what is causing these sensations, right? The brain just gets all these signals and it's trying to guess what's out there in the world, um, what is causing these sensations so it can actually make calculations about what to do. Um, and the evolutionary perspective here is, is quite simple because if you don't actually do this, right, if you don't know what's going out and are able to guess uh, uh, what situations are healthy for you, you're gonna find yourself uh, in very unhealthy situations, like a fish out of the water, or um, this cute, cute kid um, from, I think he's a Snoopy, right? Uh, inside of water. So what predictive coding actually uh, uh, shows us is that your brain combines two sources of information. Whatever is coming from your senses right now, at this moment, you're hearing me, you're seeing my face on a little screen, uh, you're also feeling your body in space. Uh, you're also uh, getting internal sensations of your breathing, uh, your proprioception, where your body is in space is being activated. But all this information is actually being combined with everything you've learned in the past. Uh, in neuroscience, we, we call this uh, priors or um, biases sometimes. There's a lot of different words for, for the same uh, concept. Uh, and these two sources of information are constantly um, sorry, um, combining each other. And what is actually happening is that the past information is turning off the present um, sensations. And a little metaphor I really like using is the sandcastle metaphor. So if you imagine your brain is building sandcastles, that our reality is actually a creative process. The castles, uh, the buckets themselves, are like your brain's priors, your brain's previous knowledge. And the sand is whatever is coming into your brain right now. So your brain has these buckets and it's constantly trying to build castles from the sand that's coming in all the time. 
So the shape of your castle, of, of your buckets, is really important because that will uh, really dictate the shape of the castle that you're able to make. So these priors and our past knowledge are really, really important to how we perceive reality moment by moment. Um, so again, the buckets are our top-down priors and the sand is the incoming signals coming from your brain. Now I want to give you a little bit of a, an actual example about how this works for you so you can feel it. Um, so if you see here, we have two images of Margaret Thatcher upside down. It's a very famous visual illusion. Now, these are the exact same images of Margaret Thatcher, but I've just flipped them over. Um, hopefully, all of you see a very big difference right now. The image on the left looks really distorted. So I'm just going to go back again. Upside down, Margaret Thatcher. Not upside down, Margaret Thatcher. Why is this happening? So we have much, much stronger models, much stronger priors about faces that are looking upright. All day we go along, you know, now maybe a little bit less because of COVID because we're not seeing so many people. But even now, every person we meet, uh, almost always we see them straight up, not upside down. So we have a very detailed model of upright faces. Um, so any little change, anything that's a little bit weird in an upright model, we will immediately feel the prediction error. Our prediction will immediately not fit the sensation that we're getting. But when it's an upside down face, the priors that we have are weaker. They're not as detailed. So when there's little changes there, our brain doesn't even perceive it. So this is a little bit about, uh, um, I wanted to give you a sensation about actually how much these buckets affect our perception on a really, really basic and, and daily level all the time. So now let's go back into um, XR and uh, uh, a little bit of a focus on VR, but very much of this is also going into um, augmented reality. Um, so we are able to, to activate higher areas of the brain that integrate multi-sensory information because actually XR isn't just about the eyes, right? It's about connecting the visuals you get with the proprioception. Proprioception is where your body is in space. So the moment you're able to move your neck and head and the world around you changes in a similar way when you're in VR or, or AR glasses, we're now connecting the visual and proprioception sensations into your brain. And we also get auditory, sometimes haptics, if you use controllers. And the more of your senses we're able to actually bring into this experience, the more of the brain we're able to activate. Now, not only can we activate the brain, we can start actually playing with the relationship between these senses. We can give you sensations that fit what your brain previously knows, or we can start giving you really strange sensations, right? For instance, if you look right, we could show you the world moving left. When you look up, we could show you the world moving upside down. Uh, when you move your hand, we can show you a tail moving. And we're going to get into more examples of that. But as designers uh, of uh, XR um, experiences, we have a really huge amount of power to control what the person in these experiences is going to sense and feel. And if these experiences are very different than what this person is used to, that's going to create a lot of novelty, a lot of prediction error, and that induces neural plasticity. So when we think about uh, XR experiences, I want you to start thinking about what in that experience is based on the person's known reality, what is the normal, right, quote unquote, um, but what is the thing the person is used to, what is familiar to them versus the novelty that you're inducing, what is the new reality you're bringing into this experience. Um, now let's see really uh, uh, how much of an influence this can have on people's uh, low level perception of what is themselves. Okay, self is a, is a very interesting concept because it's very plastic actually. And with just a, a, a little bit of manipulation, we can really create um, different experiences for people that 
change their sensation of themselves. Now, this is very normal. Every time, you know, we wear different clothing or use different tools, these tools become an extension of ourself. We stop feeling exactly where the clothing is rubbing on us. Uh, most of us, unless, you know, you, some people do have uh, sensory issues um, and it then becomes a problem. But for most of us, uh, we're able to be very plastic about what is our physical self. Um, an experiment that they do, uh, you might have heard of this, is uh, called the rubber hand experiment, where they take a rubber hand and they touch it at the same time and frequency as they touch your own hand. Uh, what this causes is very fast this person starts feeling the rubber hand as their own hand and they see actual biological um, uh, evidence for this because they take a big hammer and smash the rubber hand and see how the person's uh, heart rate spikes. So it's not just um, uh, a, a sort of subjective feeling, but you also actually have biological metrics that you can measure the connection that's happening and how your body is changing just by connecting these two senses, right? The visual sensation together with this um, haptic sensation on the skin of touch. Um, now, we can do this in VR. We can create people, and we do this all the time, by giving them, right, different avatars. You're in a different avatar that is now moving with you, um, and you're, you get a sensation both from your visuals and your haptic movements, uh, and people really start identifying with their avatars. So this is something that we need to be really aware of. Um, when we're creating uh, XR experiences that have avatars in them, this has a very, very strong effect on brains. And we'll see how this is used uh, to help people that have anorexia and dysmorphia, but we also need to take into account that whatever helps people can also cause them damage. The neuroplasticity is there and can be used and, and mutated either way. Uh, by the way, Dominique, I'm not able to see if anybody's writing anything on the chat uh, because uh, I, I needed to lower um, the screen. So if anybody's asking anything, please uh, uh, let me know, okay? Mm, yeah, sure. Great. So let's see some, uh, uh, a few examples and we'll go into uh, uh, different examples in the next session where you can actually analyze them and try to understand how they work. Um, but I want to, uh, a little bit, uh, a few examples of changing of this minimal self and uh, with extra reality experiences. So this is um, from already seven years ago. So this has been happening in academia for quite some time. Um, the ability to control a tail with your hip movements. And people can actually utilize their new tail to be faster in this game that they created where you need to touch these objects. Um, so since I saw this, I've been dreaming and prototyping having uh, my own tail in VR. Um, it's, it's, uh, I have a few prototypes that are still pretty early, but it's really, really fun. And uh, I love augmenting myself with, with new and strange body parts that can actually be used by interacting with my current body and my current movements. Um, you can see uh, what I talked about that the art can be used to treat body image disorders like anorexia. Um, in this experiment, uh, they put uh, um, people that have anorexia into avatars um, and gave them a sort of full body, the same way they did with the hand. They gave them, they did the same thing with the body, touching the person's body as the person saw the body being touched in uh, VR and that the people got a very strong identification to the new avatar to the degree that it helped them remap that their bodies were not overweight. They were able to actually um, sense that their bodies were uh, um, uh, slimmer um, and in proportions uh, um, that were more accurate because that's a big problem that happens with people that have anorexia. They, they constantly feel that they're overweight. Um, a, another really, really interesting example was that this helped uh, heal even spinal cord injuries. In this experience, um, uh, ex experiment, uh, they put people in VR 
that uh, had spinal cord injuries and they could start seeing themselves walk. Now, this was part of a bigger intervention, uh, but these people actually regained some of their ability to walk by uh, also being part of this VR experience that just showed them their ability to walk. And we know this a lot about athletes um, and people who train a lot, that the visual is really, really important. A lot of visualization techniques really help um, people that do professional sports. And we're gonna get to that uh, in a second because that was more of my research. Um, so this is uh, a few other examples about VR for pain management uh, and why it helps. So on one hand, we have the normal distraction therapy uh, where you go into VR and instead of actually seeing uh, the nurse put a syringe in you uh, or perform some type of procedure, you're just in a different place. Uh, and because your visual sensation uh, is really strong and your visual cortex is sort of like the graphics uh, card of your uh, brain, it really manages to weaken the proprioception and it weakens the physical sensation. So you really aren't as aware of the painful things that might be happening to your body. So this is a very, um, it's, it's becoming more and more popular, especially with kids uh, to put them in VR when they need to go get a shot or do some other um, procedure that might be painful. Um, Another thing that's being used is something that's called mirror therapy. Now, this was uh, invented by Ramachandran to help people that have uh, injuries where they got an amputation uh, and they lost one of their body parts, but they still feel something um, that is um, phan called phantom pain, phantom limb pain. So what they do in a normal mirror therapy is they just take a mirror where they show you uh, um, the body part that is missing and just by seeing that body part again and moving the body part that is still there that uh, helps your brain elevate this phantom pain because again if, if we go back and if we talk about the priors again your brain gets sort of stuck in thinking that that limb that was there for many years of your life is still there, right? So, uh, um, and, and it's unable, it's not getting any sensations from that limb anymore. And that causes this prediction error and this pain. So by showing the brain uh, uh, that this body part is there again, it's able to minimize that prediction error and sort of release that pain. Um, now there is there are a few companies. Uh, one of them is Corona VR that was trying to do that also in VR, um, because with VR you can do you know many different uh, um, parts of the body and create other similar like interventions where you can see the body part um, that is uh, hurt or has chronic pain um, being okay and healthy and moving in expressive ways that can then help you actually uh, uh, heal that, that part of your body and create uh, um, a, a prediction that that body part is okay. A lot of what we feel as pain is actually the priors and the belief that this is dangerous, but that's a whole other, uh, um, you could ask me at the end if you're more interested in that, that's a whole different lecture. Okay. So let's get into uh, the experience, the, the experiment, I keep saying experience and experiment today, uh, but this is the experiment that I conducted at university where I was trying to teach people really difficult movements using the art. So for most of us, it's virtually impossible to draw a circle with one hand and a square with another, and you can try it now if you want to. Um, we have a very strong prior in our brain that our hands should be moving together and doing one goal at a time. So when we tell our brain do two motor actions that are different, uh, it's really difficult for it to do and they start overlapping. You'll start doing circles together and then squares together. Um, so I was thinking, well, let's see, this is a great uh, attempt to try to teach people in VR how to do something that's very difficult. And I had this really, really big hope 
that if I could just put a person in a first person view of a person, an avatar that's able to do these movements, um, that person would then be able to do these movements because you know, you're know you in the body that's already doing them and all you need to do is sort of follow and believe that that body is yours, um, I'd be able to actually get them to do these movements better. Well, turns out I was absolutely wrong. Um, people that did this experiment thought they were doing better. They felt that they were doing better, but actually they all uh, were doing even worse. Now, after analyzing the data, I realized that that was probably happening because again, the visual sensation is stronger than the proprioception. So people believe their eyes and were actually tuning down what they were feeling from the senses themselves about where their body was in space. So their movements were even less accurate. And, and that's a very uh, interesting thing to take into account about how important it is uh, to show accurate feedback of where your body is in space because otherwise your brain really tunes down what you're feeling from your real body. When we have these two conflicting signals between what our body is doing and our visual sensation, for most people, the visual is going to win. Um, and that's a thing to take into account, again, when you're designing avatars or designing interactions and XR experiences. Now, a really interesting thing that I did find, I, I then had this idea, you know, what if I totally do something really strange to that person's body, something that is so novel, is so new, that will now even erase this high level prior that they have, that their body needs to move together. They're just going to be in such a new experience um, that will increase their prediction error. Will that make them faster and better learners? So what I did, uh, you can see on the image on the left, I actually switched their hands. So whenever a person was moving their right hand, they saw their left hand moving. And whenever they were moving their left hand, they saw their right hand moving, uh, which was a very cool intervention to do in VR and a very strange experience. You're like, I, but I'm moving this hand. What, why is that hand moving, you know? Um, and it really gives you this, what is going on feeling. Um, and in this ex experiment, I did find um, a slight improvement for most people in this learning paradigm of following the person. Um, so the ability to sort of let go of these high level beliefs that we have can actually increase learning. Um, and that's a very interesting thing to think about. Oh, it's a Sarah. little bit. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, Anne has questions. Anne, yeah. do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, I was just wondering um, if you found different results for people who are ambidextrous or, for example, like practice piano, which requires independent hand movements. Yes. Yeah, so part, part of this experiment was screening those people because it's well known that um, people who practice drumming specific, specifically, I don't know about piano, but I imagine it's quite similar, but people that practice drumming that has uh, different rhythms that you need to do with different body parts, they learn how to create these separations um, and are much better at this experience to begin with. So they are more able to do the circle square. Um, and anecdotally, uh, uh, um, in the research, I think we have like one or two other musicians that, that did show better results at the beginning level. But generally, we were screening out any drummers or any professional um, people that, that had this ability to begin with. So we wanted to take a, a task that was hard for everyone. But yeah, there is a difference. Um, okay, so we've learned from this that visual versus proprioception, visual wins for most people. And we've learned that sometimes when we totally do something that's as strange as possible for our body, we can actually learn uh, more uh, and induce this, this neural plasticity. Uh, uh, Sarah, uh, Lucy yeah. has another question. Yeah. yeah. Lucy, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, hello. I'm sorry, because uh, this question is actually related to the previous slide. Um, yes, yeah, so you 
Yes. Um, so you mentioned that the um, the mirror therapy that can help uh, alleviate the pain, right? I wonder yeah. during the research, um, would it also trigger the uh, you know the patient's depression kind of psych negative psychological feelings since it might re remind them that they used to have like their leg or arms. I wonder how did the yeah. research go? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I don't know if anybody did research on the on the uh, depression uh, uh, aspects of uh, of mirror box therapy. Uh, all I know is that it's been a very very useful pathology to deal with uh, the the chronic pain. So I would have imagined that once the chronic pain is, is removed, that helps elevate some at least of the, the depression because chronic pain has been shown to be one of the most difficult things to, uh, uh, or one of the biggest contributions to, to deep depression. If you're constantly just in pain, it's very hard to have a positive outlook on anything. Right. Um, but I don't know if specifically, right, I can understand your question, like, oh, remi remembering that you once used to have a hand or leg right. or bigger PTSD or things like that. I don't know yeah. about any research. That's a very good question. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay. So now we are around, yeah, almost 40 minutes into this. So I'm going to uh, show a video and I'm going to take some stretches too while we watch this. This is a bit of a summation video that we did uh, to explain uh, what happens uh, to your brain on VR. So I'm going to play it in a few minutes. VR is becoming a new mass medium. By 2020, around 76 million headsets are predicted to be out there. What makes VR different than just watching TV or playing a computer game? For that, we have to take a moment to understand some things about brains. There are 86 billion neurons in that brain of yours. What are they up to? According to the predictive coding theory, the brain is a prediction machine. The brain itself doesn't have direct access to the outside world, but it tries its best to guess what's going out there by combining two sources of information. The first is whatever is coming in from your senses right now. For instance, your eyes and ears. But that is very noisy information, so your brain combines that with whatever it has already learned. In cognitive neuroscience, these are called priors. This means that past experiences actually affect your here and now. All of the now and your memory, from taste, touch, smell, sound and sight, signals to unique hierarchy, become combined guidelines to your reality. An important sense most of us were not taught at school is called proprioception. Proprioception is the sense of the structure our body has in space, and it's a big part of what makes VR special. What happens when you move your head in VR? Well, that's totally up to the designers. Your brain is getting proprioception information that interacts with the visual information, so higher brain areas are being activated but the designers have control over the incoming visual information. Will the present information fit what you already know? Will you just see the stars when you look up? Or will a dancer grow together with your head movement? Or maybe when you look up, we will show you down. Careful, some of these mixed signals can confuse your brain, causing nausea. Nausea is triggered when the visual information doesn't fit the proprioception information coming from the pressure sensors in our inner ear. Our brain isn't sure if we're moving or not. VR headsets need to refresh around 90 times a second for these information streams to agree. Some poisons will cause the same disruption between our senses, so nausea might be your brain guessing it should be emptying the stomach from poison. The greater the number of senses that are activated when you become present in virtual reality, such as ambisonic 3D sound or haptics, the feedback you receive when you touch VR objects, the greater the virtual reality experience has in your cognitive and emotional responses. You can embody different characters and perspectives that might help you understand another person better. You can totally replace your body with an environment that is correlated to your movements. You can face your fears in a controlled environment. You can learn from experts in new ways. 
You can have wings that let you fly if you flap your arms. It can reduce pain. Some brilliant therapists even designed an experience where people with depression send messages to their child self and then receive that message from a body of a child. What else can VR do? Honestly, we aren't sure ourselves. That's why we created this video. We are trying to figure out this technology. What are its limitations? What are its dangers? What can be done with the user's data? This technology allows us to interact with the very fundamentals of how we perceive space and even time. If you are interested in helping shape the future of how this technology will interact with our reality, both on a personal and social level, we want your voice heard. We want you to come join us and play VR for neuroscience. So this is something, uh, the first iteration of my company, uh, we sort of pivoted, uh, but we still have this uh, awesome video. Um, and I think this pretty much covers what we did until now. It also did remind me to talk about nausea, because that's a big thing we see uh, in VR experiences. Um, and people have different sensitivities. Um, I am extremely sensitive and I spent so much time in VR and still I'm going to say so many of the experiences when I'm being moved, when the camera is moving and my body isn't moving in space, I immediately go like, oh my God, I'm going to barf, right? So this is something to be really aware of. Um, some gamers have less problems with that, uh, but it's a very, uh, you want everybody to be feel, feeling comfortable with your experience. You really need to let them move themselves. There's some tricks you can do with this. For instance, putting people um, in a car where they just have a little window um, and generally blocking the peripheral vision uh, and just showing the central vision will cause less nausea. And we see some experiences uh, um, do do that in a, in a good manner. Wait that for Okay. Wait. Oh, wait. VR is because. Okay. So we're moving into the second session where we're going to go through examples. Uh, some of them we've briefly touched about, but we can go into more depth too. First, I'm going to showcase uh, MIU as a case study. This is the, the product we're building. Then we're going to look into a little bit about the, uh, the depression treatments that are happening in VR. We're gonna look at something that's called Paint With Me, which is a really awesome uh, experience that I, uh, a person I know created. And then we're gonna look into more uh, uh, common and known experiences like Facebook Spaces, uh, uh, something that's called Spatial IO. And if you have anything you wanna share with us, either projects that you're doing or games that you're playing, um, we can do that. Now, um, and these things, I'm gonna ask you also questions. Like it's, it's. I, I want us to now practice, right? We've learned a lot of these um, basic ideas about what is healthy for the brain, what our body needs, and how uh, XR affects these things. And I really like us to to try to analyze this together, so you use that data that that we've learned. Um, okay, but first, let's give you a quick case overview of what MIU is and. Uh, why I'm dedicating so much of my life to try to build it. Um, so Miu is a new form of communication where you get this 3D giant puppet in VR that you can puppet and follows your movements and then you can send these 3D expressions to your friend. You can also do it from a mobile phone uh, by uh, putting the mobile phone in front of you, copy it copies your movements again and sends them into AR space or into VR. So we can do this cross-platform from VR to uh, newer mobile phones and also to GIFs. And I'm very excited about it because uh, it actually gets people to move and we can create all these things that are movement-based to create this empathy um, and sensation of connection to our friends. So you're gonna see a few clips of examples in, in the background as I talk about the principles uh, that we use to make sure that what we're building is healthy. So generally speaking, the really uh, principle number one is that we want to build a tool that people have agency over. Now, 
this is, it sounds like uh, maybe obvious or, or something very simple, but actually from a business perspective and when you're cre a creator that's creating, for instance, a game or something like that, it's very difficult because so many of the games we create and so many of the experiences that are put out there are built on maximizing addiction to this thing, right? People, for instance, all social media currently, they just want to stick us to the social media being constantly browsing, right? Um, most games that you play want you to just be constantly playing them. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the advertisement business model. The moment uh, your company or whatever you're building is being funded by people's eyeballs, you're going to need to maximize people's eyeballs on uh, whatever you're building. And that is going to create an unhealthy situation for the people that are using whatever you're building. Uh, and that's a, a hard thing to face for me as a, as a creator because I do want people to play in the world I'm building for them, but I also want to make sure it doesn't become an addiction. I want to make sure it augments their, uh, the, their real life uh, and they let go of it and put it down when they're finished. So we're going to go into a little bit of um, the design choices we made um, to try to make sure that this is what's happening. So the second principle we have is that we only build things that we want to use ourselves and we want our families and friends to use. I don't know how many of you have uh, watched the, the, the social network that, that came out on Netflix um, not long ago. But you'll see a lot of Facebook and Twitter executives say, no way is my family going to use this. No way do I use this. They know how unhealthy this is. Um, and they, do, they don't want their kids on it, right? So if you're building something that uh, you don't want your kids on, why are you doing that? At least that's the perspective of me and my co-founder. We will only build things that we ourselves think are awesome and fun and want our friends and family to use. So the third principle is really utilize and invest in scientific research that can help us make sure what we are building is healthy for ourselves. And this is also very hard as we're basically indie developers. We don't have a lot of funding. Um, and to create user tests and scientific research uh, is very expensive. But we can try our best. We can both read all the research uh, and do user testing to see that what we're building is actually uh, benefiting people and giving them what we want, want it to give them. So these three principles are really important for us. Now let's go into some of the design choices that we made. So first let's talk about physical health. We wanted to maximize movement and minimize addiction of the scrolling, right? Minimize this addiction of watching the next thing, watching the next thing sort of passively that happens in a lot of our consumption of media right now. So for instance, we made a decision not to have an auto loop on playback. When you get a message, it plays back once. If you want to play it again, you need to take it out of the playback and put it back in the playback. So you need to take a physical action with your whole body to replay the message again. So you have all this time to change and decide what you're doing with the message. If you're replying to it, if you're quitting the app, it's, we give your brain time to make that decision and have agency. Uh, because this auto loop is really taking away people's agency because it's just like, okay, the next thing, the next thing. And we see that on TikTok, on YouTube, um, so many other applications that just keep Netflix, you know, the next thing just auto plays. Um, the next thing we decided was that phone notifications will be off by default. If people do want to constantly get a notification, they, they can opt into this. And again, we're still building the apps, especially the AR app is very new. Um, so we don't even have any notifications uh, for phone right now on the app, only to email. But when that feature comes out, uh, they, it will be off by default. Uh, the, the next thing we did is that our whole UI is based on movements that require you to stretch and are slightly different. So the placements of, um, if you can see in this video a little bit, there's an orb 
that you move from record to playback to send uh, to the more options to home. So every interaction you're doing is in some way very natural. You're taking a thing and putting it somewhere. We sort of mimic the old diskette use or uh, playing a, a, a CD or an album. Right? There's an actual object that you move around. That's what our bodies are very used to doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing versus just like pressing a button on a controller that only uses your fingers. And we even had these UI elements are slightly moving with a little bit of uh, um, change based on where you are. So they're not always in the exact same space. So we give you slight movement varieties. And uh, we always make them based on your height. So the send button will always be in a position that you need to actually stretch to get to. And for me, that's always really nice to see how people are like, oh, wait. And then they, they do. They stretch and they get to, to the send button. Um, so by creating an environment that requires people to utilize more of their body movements, we're able to just increase people's movements. Um, just by playing. Now the game itself is of course all about dancing and movement, but even in the UI, you can create a UI that's healthier. Um, you can also see, for instance, the keyboard that we have here that's also these movement keyboards instead of the remote control keyboards. Um, so everything in the UI is based on, on increasing movement. Next, uh, what we did is we wanted to really have a design that uh, prevents anorexia and dysmorphia. So, um, and this is such a big issue with social media, with everybody wanting to look sexy and, you know, these filters on your face and body that always give you um, a, a very, uh, for, especially for young girls, it's just pretty terrible, the over-sexualization that they go through um, and, and affects their self-esteem so much. So instead, we wanted to make our avatars crazy and fun and strange and something that lets you ex express your inner self. Now, our plans for the future are letting people bring in their own avatars, their avatars helping them build their own um, modes of expression. But uh, for us, it was very important to start with um, things that are uh, different and strange and a, a very unique particle system too that lets you have even only particles. You can just be 20,000 particles in our system and not even have a body. Uh, Sarah, so, uh, yeah. I think Hadasha has another question. Yeah. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, I just wanted to ask if you can adapt it to people that are handicapped that can't stretch to reach the buttons? Uh, I think I, I recognize your voice, Mom. Is that you? <laughs> Hi, thanks for joining. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. So what, one thing we did do uh, for handicap is you only need one hand. Um, and definitely that's a good thing to think about of having some type of form that um, lets people bring uh, the buttons closer to them if they need to. Um, that's currently not something that, that we support, but definitely a good thing, especially since you're trying to connect me, I know, to uh, uh, use this more for the older population than my company is mobile. Uh, but the stretch is a minimal stretch. It's not like you need to be on your tippy toe, but it does require you to uh, go above your head. So the button will always appear above your head uh, in a place where you need to reach for. Yeah, so th thanks for that. Um, okay, so uh, the second thing we're doing for body dysmorphia to prevent that is having uh, a third person puppeteering. So instead of when you're especially in VR, you're not looking down and seeing your avatar, you're puppeteering the avatar from a third person. Uh, and that's something that, you know, we've been doing for generations and generations since humans were, were um, uh, before pre-technology, we were puppeteering and shadow puppeting. So this is something that our brain is much more used to um, and won't create so many competing um, um, 
predictions and competing sensations with what you know your body is right now. Because we envision this, you know, if people are going to use this a lot, then we don't want to give them this false sensation of what their body is. Um, okay. Now, uh, some of our choices about how to create a design that increases pro-social connections. So all of our games are based currently on joint action and mimicry. So you can play games like blowing kisses and your friend needs to catch them. You can play a game that's actually a mimic game where your friend does a movement and you need to follow that movement and you get a score. Um, we could very easily have created shooting games uh, with your body movements, but we decided to start uh, with things that are pro-social because we want to balance out uh, all the violence and all the shooting games that are out there. And I love some shooter games, don't, don't get me wrong, but I think if that's the only thing we're offering um, humanity, especially teenagers, people, um, it's a, it's a problem. We need to offer different types of things. We need to offer pro-social and uh, Joint action is a term from neuroscience when you're doing something together, because this is what actually creates uh, the sympathetic bond and connection with, with friends. Um, another thing we're building into the system is something we're calling snowflake messages. Uh, part of the problem with social media currently is it's so not special, right? You get this heart emoji from your friend. They probably sent the same heart emoji to 10 different people that day. And that flattens out this uh, authenticity of uh, the connections that, that you have with a person. So we want to create messages that you know you're the only one that received them. And I want to know that if I get a hug from the person that, that cares about me, that hug was made uniquely for me that person moved their body, their whole body, not just their little finger, to actually um, give me a sensation of love and care. Uh, and I think that just knowing that and receiving that special thing that was made only for you um, can really help in some of this flattening that we're seeing uh, happening to social media today, uh, where just like, the same meme gets sent out to everyone. Okay, so now uh, let's take a deep breath and shake it out because now I'm going to actually be uh, asking you things uh, based on what we learned today. If you can try to help us figure out some of these experiences, uh, tell us why you think they're healthy or helping, or if you see things that are unhealthy uh, based on what we've learned today. So I will describe this experience again because we went over really briefly um, in the video. Um, this is an experience where people that were resistant to depression medication uh, and suffering from very ser serious depression um, went into VR. In VR, they encountered a crying child and they were there with a therapist and the therapist encouraged them, can you please uh, help this crying child? Can you try to calm them down? Um, the person then did that. And the second part of the experience was the person went into VR, but this time they were in the body of a crying child and they could see their own avatar that they were in just moments ago was now in front of them and um, creating the same movements that they did, using the same voice, the same words, right, that they did towards them. So basically when that parent, when that person was an adult, all their body movement voice was being recorded and then replayed back while they were being in a child body. So do we have anyone that's uh, willing to maybe analyze why, why this, uh, worked so well. Um, so the, the, this experiment actually showed amazing results. Um, so in this framework that we were talking about where we're able to use VR to be neuroplastic and change our priors, can somebody think maybe um, why this experiment helped so much? Well, I think it, uh, in the chat, uh, we have some people kind of asking some questions and people yeah. are responding. So. Um, like yeah. Miriam, Hadasha, Cora, and 
Tamara, uh, do no, you guys want to ask or answer some questions? Uh, uh, hi, sorry. Um, it's just something about the um, about the audio. It's a little static. Maybe someone else has their um, mic open. It just um, makes it a little bit hard to concentrate on Sarah's words. Um, that's not really a question question. Yeah, it might be coming from uh, my garage. I'm sorry about that. I'm in a garage that has some air conditioning. So it might be coming from me. All right, no worries. Yeah, anything else? Uh, yeah, well, I think Sarah asked the question about why this was so powerful. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I think maybe actually seeing the child, like, um, you know, I, I know this is done in therapy sometimes or in writing and it's very powerful then, but like to actually see like a child person that might represent you could make it that much more powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's de de definitely one part of it is um, seeing uh, someone else you're helping. Sometimes it's much easier to help someone else than, than to help yourself. Um, anyone else want to postulate a little bit about why this experiment was so successful? Uh, yeah, I mean, like before I read a book, it's, it's, it's like um, uh, VR can totally teleport us to another uh, different environment and then uh, change out the way that we perceive the world. Uh, and one of the chapter, he says that uh, they have another kind of like test, te uh, test like the experimental um, VR stuff. They, they put um, the, the user into different avatars. For example, like they, they, they put a white people into a black people's body and then Later on, like experiment, uh, like how black people see the world uh, inside the VR world. And after that, the, 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 the white user take out the, um, the headphone, uh, like the headset and start saying like, oh, yeah, because I start aware uh, of myself as a, kind of recognize myself as black person, then I start being more empathized about black person because I start thinking like them and I start thinking like how people perceive me and then uh, the person, like the user start thinking differently and translate her thinking into like totally inside the person's shoes. So yeah, yeah, I don't know whether this is like- so That's a great uh, example. That's a, a different type of example, but it's uh, ver similar in the effect that we really can mutate our sense of self, right? And the experiment that you're talking about, um, uh, a person into a, a, an avatar of a, uh, a black person who is able to mutate and change their priors, their previous knowledge of, uh, about how they experience the world and feel more empathy towards people uh, that, that are uh, black and need to deal with uh, racial biases and racism. Um, so in this experiment, uh, the bias that they were trying to change, so many people with depression, uh, their, their trauma and depression comes from their inner child, from a belief inside of them or a trauma that happened when they were very young. Now, it's very hard to, to change that uh, child trauma, that belief that happened when you were very young in your brain. It, it can be a very, very strong belief. Um, and what they did here is, they let that person experience themselves again as a child, but actually they themselves were able to soothe that child first. This was a surprise. They didn't even know that they were going to do this. They first just thought, oh, this child is just an external child. I need to help. I want to help. Um, and they did that with their own voice and their own body movements. Then they went into the body of this child uh, and received that. And that way they were able to actually change that uh, previously hurt belief and prior that was stuck in their brain and calm it. So there was some belief there that was stuck in the brain of a hurting child constantly going on somewhere in their subconscious. And by receiving the soothing words from themselves, they were able to 
update that model and update that belief about themselves that was still stuck in there. Um, so that's uh, at least my, my theory based on this predictive coding framework about why this experiment was so successful. And again, they combined it, they combined audio, they combined visual. So they were able to activate so much of a person's brain in this experience. Um, next, I want to talk to you about a little experience that's called Paint With Me, um, where an artist is painting an image and talking about her, her experience. She has a camera on top of her head. Uh, and then you, as a, a, the player, gets to see from her point of view in her first person. And you can actually overlay your hands uh, this uses uh, this is a little bit old Bef before the Oculus could do hand tracking. Um, it used the leap motion cameras, and you could actually overlay your hands on top of the artist and sort of follow the artist, um, and also follow her thought process about how she's creating the art. Um, and they they showed um, in this uh, experience it wasn't so much about how well your drawing was or how similar it was to the artist, but it was about uh, your empathetic connection to the artist and your understanding of her thought processes um, and, and really a, a low level feeling of connection to that artist uh, all improved uh, in that paper. Uh, so does anybody want to um, think out loud why this ex experiment was uh, so successful in building that empathetic connection? based on what we talked about? It's quiz time. Nope, no one? Uh, yeah, uh, I think... Um, I'm trying uh, to talk less and let people talk more. But, Lucy uh, and Cobra, I think you guys post something that related to the, the therapy. Okay. Yeah. 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 Lucy, uh, I actually posted it for the earlier yeah. earlier ones, but um, the uh, how, um, but you already explained it. I think it's really enlightening. I I didn't think that I didn't think uh about that aspect of you like yourself, uh, the adult self can because it's adult self, uh, your yeah. own thoughts. It actually can sue your child mm -hmm. self because it's all come from you. So it's even more persuading exactly. from you know the words that's coming from others so i definitely that that part is really enlightening i, I thought that's yeah i, I this experiment was uh, amazing and i actually recreated this with a baby um oh you did so i i have if anybody wants uh i can send a, a free package up for you to, to play with uh um, it's not like perfect, but just the ability to use uh, body movements and voice uh, in a baby. And then the next part, you're, you're tiny and there's a big, big hands and like big yeah. amorphic face. And you hear the voice uh, that you recorded uh, because sometimes I think uh, 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 there's even earlier trauma than childhood. So um, you can go back and try to reprogram that too. Right. I think we're all very <laughs> interested. I see people typing and saying, yeah, we're, uh, yes, please. Um, so, but yeah. does it, does it have to be, um, we have to use Oculus in order to use uh, that? It's a package, it's a, it's a Unity package and a Unity game. I think it oh. might work on the Vive too, but okay. um, uh, it's, it's been a, quite a few years since I, I've, um, we used to create very quick uh, and small prototypes. Um, back in the day but uh yeah with whatever's out there I, I can happily send yeah that that does sound really interesting and about the next the painting one yeah. um I, I i think it's for me it's the same um because you can see you can see how the artist is painting like where she's starting uh, i mean the the women in the photo or whoever the artist is you can see where yeah. she starts and how she express herself you can see her viewpoint um you can focus on the paintbrush and how she, um, I guess, uh, you know, did the, the paint like in very detailed view. So um, that that will be very inspiring for people who actually don't really know how to paint or just lack mm -hmm. of, have lack yeah. of inspiration. And this might help them to see like, okay, the, the artist there 
probably struggle at some part in that inspire them to actually create something. That's my yeah. thought. <laughs> yeah. And a big, so a big part of it was not just uh, seeing the, the viewpoint, but also seeing um, the painter's body and actually moving their hands with that. Right. Uh, because we've seen how much that can actually affect you to think and feel that you are the same as it's a little bit uh, similar to this mirror, mirror box. Um, uh, sensation but this time it's not with your own body it's with somebody else's body so you're mirroring that other body onto you and being able to update your brain's predictions into like oh I can do this too right um, so that that's uh, a, a little bit about what was going on here um, okay. oh very interesting thanks for sure so um, now we're going to go into uh, some uh, more common experiences and we're going to watch, we're not going to watch the whole uh, little video of this, but just a few seconds of the intro of Facebook Spaces. Um, ha have any of you been in Facebook Spaces? So annoying that I can't actually be and see what you guys are voting, otherwise I block your screen. But um, These are my friends. Okay, this is my quest. And we're yeah. about to rise to the top. Hey guys. Hey sis. Hey Jack. Are you all excited for our trip? Yeah. And look what I found. <gasps> This is so cool. Is this the same spot we're going to? I hope so. And look, I think that's where we're taking the boat tour. Oh, I love it. Look, I'm gonna go chat with Melissa, but you're setting up the party room, right? Yeah, I got it. Great, see you later, Jack. All right, see you later. Bye. Hey, girl. Guess what? What? I got the apartment. Wow, nice. Look at your balcony. I know, it's amazing. No roommates. <laughs> I have it all planned out. The lucky blue couch. Yes. This table with this floor. <gasps> Perfect. <laughs> Jack keeps calling me. Can we talk later? Sure. Bye. Surprise! <laughs> Happy birthday! Thanks, you guys. Happy no, birthday. stop, don't let like uh, Okay, so here I want to take a bit more of a critical look. Uh, and based on the things that we've been talking about, um, can people suggest things that they think are not optimal in um, the avatar creation uh, in this in this experience? Bye. Okay. Um, anyone else want to answer that? Uh, so you want to uh, ask us? I want to ask, yeah. yeah. Do you see anything that's unhealthy in this avatar creation um, that Facebook Spaces went uh, and, and created based on uh, the things we've been talking about um, for avatar creation and dysmorphia and all these things? Yeah, uh, I think Cora has some answers. Cora, do you want right. to unmute yourself? Oh, um... I don't act. I was just saying it's not the most realistic, but um, I don't know much beyond that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's great. So you're right. It's not the most realistic. Um, so the problems, and I actually sat with uh, the design team of Facebook Spaces giving them this feedback because uh, they're all very nice people, but they're not necessarily aware of, of uh, the latest research. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't change anything. Uh, they, they, I think they created one extra interaction that I recommended that they should create, but otherwise, all the, the warning signals that I suggested, they did nothing with, but I tried. So um, the biggest issue with these avatars is, uh, as I see it, is their bodies. Everybody is forced to be in a body that looks like a 10-year-old, thin 10-year-old, prepubescent. Now, um, both being in that body constantly and then interacting with that type of body constantly is going to start competing with what our body looks like actually and is quite likely to increase uh, 
create, uh, creating uh, anorexia and dysmorphic feelings because we cannot look like the body of a prepubescent um, thin teenager. So that that was uh, um, I think one of the biggest issues. Uh, people have different body shapes, and they should we should find a way to if you're going that route of recreating something that's supposed to be similar to you, we need to give people the ability to have different types of bodies that represent their body shape. Um, otherwise, it's both both just like mentally you feel like, oh wait, my, my body's excluded from this type of space. But also, as we've seen on this really low level, your brain's gonna start competing with this and be like, wait, you know, you go out of outside of VR and you're like, wait, I don't look like this. So that was uh, one of the biggest issues. They also, of course, have issues with like the elbow placements. They're not where the, everyone's dealing with in, in VR. It's very hard to guess where your elbows are supposed to be um, because we don't have sens sensors on where the elbows are. So your elbows are looking weird and not in the places that uh, you're supposed to. There's, they, they actually are, right? And as we've seen before, that is going to decrease the sensation that you have of your body. Um, if you see your elbow in a place where your elbow actually isn't, you know, there's like a few centimeters or a rotational difference, uh, you're going to get competing signals and your brain is going to prefer the visual signal. So this is going to actually slowly start turning off the sensation that you're getting from where your elbows actually are. Do we want this uh, long term? Uh, unless you have maybe elbow pain that you're trying to reduce, uh, the answer for me would be no. I want to actually maintain a strong connection to where my body is in space regularly. Um, another problem, um, if you can see, they're blinking. These avatars tend to blink and have facial expressions that are really algorithmically based. They're not based on what you're actually doing. They have some algorithms based on the sound of your voice and some obscure timing mechanism that the avatars blink to make them look more human to other people. Uh, but a lot of this experience is also taking things like selfies and looking at videos that you can of yourself. And when you see facial expressions that you're not doing and blinks that you're not doing, once again, it's competing with your own sensation of your face um, and is very uh, disconnecting and dys dysmorphic. Like we have a very strong sensation, especially of blinking. Uh, when I was in this experience a few times, whenever my avatar blinked, I found myself trying to blink too because it's so strong. There's these competing predictions and my brain wants to do what it sees. So if it sees myself blinking, I try to blink myself. Um, so that was um, also a, a, an unhealthy uh, part of this experience. And these are all things that we're going to need to figure out how to deal with as we uh, create XR that we want to be healthy. Okay. Um, I think this is the, uh, the last uh, example I have here. This is from Spatial IO. This is a collaborative working uh, experience that is sort of cross-platform from your computer or in VR. You can create your own avatar and then share your screen, uh, do lectures, talk about, uh, they're, they're making it really for the workforce to try to be, you know, instead of Zoom, which has in some ways immense potential, but also then I get this avatar. Um, does anyone want to comment? And feel free, it's my face thing, creature, but feel free um, to criticize this avatar. Um, and, and what do you think it will do to me to see myself as something like this, to others that interact with me when I'm looking like this? Anyone? I think your face looks very normal. I think the rest of that is just very proportionately off to me. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it, it looks actually less terrible in, in, uh, on a 2D screen than in VR, uh, but there are definitely misproportions that they did with my face and, my, and it's like squished on the neck side. And yes, it does not fit the proportions of my body. So there's like a head and then a disproportional body. Um, a lot of what this falls into is the term uncanny valley. Um, 
if you've heard of, about that. So our brain, again, when we're talking about these predictions, when there is a prediction that's close to what we know about humans, and we see this a lot in robotics research uh, and in interactions with avatar research. So when we get an avatar or robot that is close to being human, but it's not perfect, the competing predictions are really strong and we actually get more prediction error and it feels really creepy. And that's called the uncanny valley. Um, so this is what this experience fell into, this uncanny valley when you're trying to interact with something that is semi-realistic. It's like in some ways very realistic, but it's also not exactly, especially when you're in this in, in VR and 3D and it's like blinking in a weird way and not connecting to the body and my face is like morphed a little bit. Um, I was interacting with my partner. We were experience, experimenting with this and I was really distressed. I love my partner very much uh, and I was looking at him and he was like all warped in a way that was really like, oh, what is going on? Like, this is not how you look like um, and these are not your body proportions. So um, this is something we really need to be careful with if we are going the route of trying to create something realistic, uh, not to fall into the uncanny valley. Um, okay, so now it's uh, really your turn. We have around uh, uh, half an hour if you want to uh, ask more questions, if people want to share their projects, if people want to ask about um, other VR experiences or games that they play and get my opinion and get the group's opinion, now's the time. So I'm going to go back into, I'm going to stop the share so I can see everyone. Okay, great. Um, yeah, anyone has any questions related to today's talk or anyone wants to discuss their project related to uh, AR, VR, or XR? Hi, I have a question. Uh, yes. Sarah, thank you so much for the great presentation. This was very helpful. The question I have is, this unhealthy situation because of the, the VR design wrong, are any of this having lasting uh, effect or is this something that's reversible? That's a, a really, really great question that shows how much we need to be doing more research. There is, uh, um, so with, we know that this can help help long-term with anorexia. Uh, the experiments that they've done with anorexia patients ha, uh, were followed up, I think, a few months at least later. I don't think there's any research that has followed anything for more than a few months. Also because, you know, VR on the consumer side is pretty new. Uh, also because, unfortunately, the companies that are creating VR don't actually have research divisions that are focused on the long-term effects and well-being for us which I think is a, a really a, a disaster. And we as con customers and, and consumers need to be pushing these companies to, to create this type of research. Um, so all I can say is that long-term effects positive for anorexia for, for a few months have been found. So presumably the same type of negative effects could also be found uh, in a few months, but there's no actual research on it, on that yet. Thank Definitely you. super, super important to be making that research, yeah. Um, especially as we're seeing more teenagers and, um, and kids go into VR and just spend so much time there. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, as for the unhealthy avatar, I want to ask, uh, is that like um, all space, they have like a super, you know, you know, like cylinder and one hand, and there's no even arms, you know, it's just like a hand. So Altspace has, I used to like the Altspace avatars because of that. You could just be like a robot, something that's really different from what you are. Mm -hmm. um, they were uh, uh, not, you know, trying to be uh, uh, sexy or beautiful or trying even to look like you. It was just a very alternative thing. So the moment you're not competing 
The mm -hmm. further we get from what we actually are, the less competition your brain has. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a lot more like really wearing uh, this big costume, right? And we do wear costumes and take them off. Our brain can do that and we can identify with a costume and then take it off and become our normal, our usual selves again. So I used to like the Outspace avatars. Recently, they've changed them. I don't know when you were there last, but uh, I was part of the Outspace uh, uh, Burning Man uh, thing, and I was so surprised. I went into Outspace, and now they have avatars that look very much like the Facebook avatars. Again, this like cute, asexual, young version of yourself. Uh, so I was actually disappointed that they decided to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, so so you prefer like uh, the avatar look looks uh, like they they don't look like uh, yourself, right? So you won't compete. And then as for special that I oh I try uh, like I went there like yeah. one one time or two times, yeah. uh, and then I find out that because they use your two D photos, yeah, uh, yeah, so it it looks weird in three D yeah. space. And also, when when someone talks to you, you can hear the voice, and the mouse is not opening. Yeah. It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So something is, yeah. I think I, they did yeah. change. I think the last when I tried it not long ago, I think the mouse is moving. But you're right; it doesn't. It didn't. It still didn't move very accurately. So there's uh, this like weird thing that happens, and yeah. also the audio isn't spatial. So. The person oh. you're you're hearing the audio, but not from where the person is coming from. Oh, so when they it's design the space, it's not like they put like a, a audio listener, like yeah, um, exactly. I think on the avatar they kind of put okay the audio. Like I at least when I was experiencing it, um, uh, I just heard the audio from everywhere, and I was just like, wait, where, where are you? You're, oh, I hear you somewhere, yeah. but I, I don't know where the person is. And you see this um, in a lot of uh, um, VR experiences that are multiplayer, it's very hard to have a conversation, uh, both because of your, the audio just is like coming from everywhere. Yeah. And the moment two people speak, it's still not well coordinated. And this is very hard technology. Like we are, I like yeah. comparing the stage we are in, in VR now as you remember those old big, big phones. Yeah. I remember my mom used to have those. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, I like this huge phone that is just still mm. sort of working. But but so we are really in the beginning days of VR. And that's why I think it's uh, so important that we get as many voices that have knowledge uh, about how to create healthy VR, how to be informed uh, consumers so we can pressure these companies to build things that are healthy for us mm. from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, like, just just look at the history of video games. We know that probably VR avatar will be similar like video avatar, right? Before it's like a two D sprite, and later on be become like a realistic. So I don't know, like, what do you see the avatar choice? Because like, with the technology becomes better. Because previously we had some speakers, and then. We know that, for example, like 3D, like some cloud or some, you know, resolution, everything is become better and better each year. And people, I would say like a lot of developers, they are compete about, you know, specs, right? Like a dev specs. And then, so that's why I think people are trying to um, put the best, you know, 3D modeling, like the most realistic one, uh, like in the space and kind of like, make it optimized. So yeah. yeah, so do you see this is a trend for the avatar so, easy to- Already now, if uh, you know, if you are part of like, a, a, I think Facebook has their own labs where they can take uh, 100,000 photos of you, not like spatial where you just take one photo. Oh. They have a, a special lab that takes photos from all different angles and you spend some time in there actually talking and they create an AI model of you mm, wow. that actually moves and does the facial expressions that are very similar to you. Now that takes a lot of time to build and a lot of money to build currently. Mm. Um, but uh, Facebook already has some examples of that. So that's probably we're going to see that for the workplace. 
right? We're gonna have some app that we actually train an AI model of ourselves uh, mm -hmm. that looks at us from all these different angles. Um, you can already create a very accurate, um, there's an AR app that I used to create an accurate app really good uh, accurate model of, of a single face and then I, I could like smile and do my smile face and my angry face so I've been playing around with that to be able to um, communicate facially uh, but we're probably going to see some things like that uh, that combines AI with actually training that AI you'll spend maybe half an hour an hour in it and maybe maybe even you know more as as you spend longer and longer in it, it'll be able to have a better model and more accurate model of you. Um, and then when you go into these workspaces, you'll be able to be very similar, uh, possibly at some point indistinguishable um, from, from actually in, 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 I don't know, 10 years from now, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's um, one thing. And the second is the fantastical. This is, you know, my company, we're not trying to be similar to you. you I, I, I think the special thing that VR gives us is the ability to be something else. I want to have the wings. I want to have the tail. Uh, I want to be butterflies. Like I, I can be me all the time. <laughs> Why do I need to be all this technology in order to just copy paste me, right? Um, so this is more um, uh, the direction that I'm going with Radix Motion is to let you express your imagination and your creativity um in these worlds now will this take off in the office space will people feel comfortable communicating to me about serious topics when uh, uh i look like a bunny or uh, <laughs> a tentacle creature i wish you know that's what i'm aiming for is my company yes um but we'll, we'll need to see if if that takes off um but definitely in gaming, I think that is going to be the direction. Um, and possibly a thing also that we're working on and looking into are a sort of combining, yes, giving you somewhat your facial um, um, face in there or something that is a similar model, but morphing it. So a little bit of a combination that similar to what you can see on like Snapchat filters, right? Where you can be a, a unicorn Snapchat, but it still morphs your face in AR. So we are seeing these things uh, in AR on video, which is a lot lower bandwidth and a lot easier to do than 3D. But we are probably going to start seeing that um, in 3D too. So you could com combine both have wings and look like a cat, but it'll still have your cat face features, uh, your eyes, and somewhat your smile, and things like that. That's probably what we'll see too. Yeah, and then what's uh, I, I know that uh, your company's like a f like the the lens is kind of not for commercial, more like for family and friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as for uh, right now, you see like for example like Spark AR, Lens Studio or some, you know, even as well, they are doing the, you know, the AR, but in the website. So like fit of uh, face filter. So what do you see those more commercial uh, face filter? Uh, like, do you think they are not healthy? Because uh, I would say 90% of them not really targeting on sexy or something. I know some, exactly. some, yeah. Some 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 filters that they you know like pretty girls and then a lot of bubbles that's more like a sexy, but I would say a lot of them are pretty creative you know like the face come out and become a robot or something like Westworld or something and yeah. then Halloween scenes and what do you see those like another ninety percent that is not targeting on sexy or compare yourself yeah. Yeah, so I, I, that's why I think it's really important to have this information out there and to have diverse creators out there, right? Um, because if, it's, it's up to us, really, what this turns into. And I do really like that both Lens and even fa uh, Facebook, Spark AR, they are very accessible tools. Like within, if you're a little bit technical, you don't need yeah. to know how to code, but if you're a little bit inclined to creativity, it's not uh, uh, more complicated than using uh, Photoshop or any other design tool. Uh, and you can create 
whatever you want with that. Um, and now it really is up to people that that uh, uh, believe in diversity um, and want to see different things that aren't just the sexy, cute, uh, female uh, um, flattening of what we are um, to, to create these things. Uh, and it's it's um, we'll see what the market you know there is a still a very very strong market force. And, and the patriarchy is still a big part of our lives, like trying to make us into this um, um, cute creature. And there's nothing also wrong about being uh, cute and sexy and there, you know, but just as long as we have the choice to be other things too, and to be liked and respected for being other things too. Like, uh, um, so it's all about opportunities and possibilities. Uh, and I think that in general is something that I, I highly support and is highly healthy for our brains to be playing with these things. Um, uh, an amazing uh, face filter that was probably now, my, the, I think, was it China or Russia that made the, the old face filter? I think it was Ch China, right? Do you remember there was this fan? Everybody was taking... Um, oh, like when you were a baby and your, then of you, your old, yeah, of your and then old you self. slide and then it becomes an old version of you, uh, an old version of yourself, yeah. And that also has uh, um, immense uh, uh, possibilities in helping you empathize with your older self. And they've done a really interesting research with things like uh, uh, saving up for your pension. Mm. Uh, or, or having a healthy diet, like caring about your future self is not trivial. A lot of us are just like, okay, future Sarah is going to deal with this. I'm not going to clean the room now. I'm going to eat junk food now. Yeah. Future Sarah, we, we, you know, this, again, the self creature yeah. is really so plastic and so amorphic that we're able to even distance our future selves and not think about it as if and, and not care about our future selves and using these tools to see your future selves uh, there have been experiments that show that that actually helps people save more for retirement uh, helps them stick to healthy diets helps them quit smoking so there is a lot of interesting research about showing you your future self uh, and an older version of you to feel empathetic towards that. So that's also an interesting use case um, that we might be seeing pop up more. Yeah, that, that, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So any other questions? I'm really curious if any of you are working on uh, VR or AR experiences or any other um, like creative expression things with other technologies. Um, I would love to hear uh, uh, what other are working on if anyone here is uh is doing something uh yes actually i did some i did um some um spark ar uh yeah and i did some small games uh for uh spark ar uh and i also do lens uh, studio um yeah so i'm kind of a little bit technique and uh also i self-taught nearly coding and everything on my own because i just love it and i use unity uh, I think this year I just launched another iOS AR app. It's related to SpaceX. Pretty much kind of celebrate them to um, launch to NASA astronauts, Bob and Doc to ISS. So I pretty much self-taught all the code and then within six months and figuring out <laughs> an app because my background is UX UI. So I've been doing UX UI for more than 10 years. So, I mean, doing 3D stuff is kind of like adding Z space, it's adding a lot of stuff. So I'm kind of learning all the stuff on my own and then I finish it. And now I want to do something, kind of like I'm doing something um, related to game and education. So mm -hmm. I made like a, a periodic table because when I was young, when I remember periodic table, oh, yeah. I like all the elements I was memorized by heart, but I was thinking about what if I can make some elements that related to story or games yeah, yeah, that might be easier idea. for, for, for yeah, people. Yeah, I had a remember. very similar idea about uh, from neuroscience, uh, the neurotransmitters, you know, adrenaline and serotonin and dopamine to do something that teaches that with like characters. Hmm. But it could be very, very cute, I think, yeah, to have like a AR characters that are the elements. 
Yeah, for example, similar to yeah.、Um, Pokemon Go, right? Yeah. Because yeah. when I because I was a little addicted、uh, to Pokemon Go,、um, yeah. I I memorize a lot of animal like、Pokemon、monsters.、Go. Yeah, people know. That. I know my、yeah. little brother knew all the names of Pokemon Go. Yeah,、uh, Pokemon, but, but but after remember it, it, it's not really helping my、no. reality, right?、Yeah. So what if we kind of change? And make it a little useful information, little bit not too useful, because people will 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 like, oh no, <laughs> yeah. So maybe we add a little bit of information just to make people want to learn, because I think the desire of learning is more important than the knowledge or information itself. Because you see, like a lot of I would say back in Taiwan, it's really interesting. Like our all our education was so strict, and everyone after they. They they study in university. They start to kind of like become lazy and don't want to learn anymore because they think, yeah, yeah I've been done with all the education. It's、uh, the lack of creativity, right? The universities. I also had this after my first degree in physics. It took me maybe three four years to go back to academia because I was so traumatized by the way they teach you, like、yeah. lack of creativity and just like squashing. Buckets of data for you to remember.、Um, yeah, that's that's like a really really cool idea、um, to to do something like that. It's awesome. Yeah, cool. Anyone? Do you do you, yeah,、okay. do you find? I just have a question for you. Between Sparks AR and lenses, do you have a preferred tool? Which of them is easier、oh. or better? Yeah. Oh, okay. So、uh, as for Spark AR and Lens AR, it depends on what you want to do. For example.、Um, Because I,、uh, I had some C sharp background, so、um, and I learned Unity first.、Yeah. I learned the hardest one first, so that's、yeah. why both of them are easy for me. <laughs> after the hardest one, yeah. Yeah. and then what I like about Spark AR is that you can upload uh, uh, the uh, the the, the models. bigger yeah the models, and they partner with Sketchfab, so、mm. which is great. You just Click the library and you drag and drop, yeah, that's great. And also, it has the visual, you know, visual coding. I mean, I,、yeah. I, I, I can code, but sometimes I、yeah. need to Google and copy and paste. But、yeah. visual coding is like, yeah. yeah, it's just like a nod, link, nod.、Yeah. So I think the interaction is really easy to use. And Spark AR, they have a super strong community in Facebook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. they have someone to kind of feature the. Tutorial before I was like compete with the tutorial because I for for me I like to learn something for four hours and after four hours I start teaching. Makes so、yeah. so my brain is fresh, right? So I can learn a lot of、yeah. really hard stuff within eight hours. Yeah, like Saturday or Sunday. So、yeah. I I just like learn everything really fast just by like learn four hours and teach back right after learning. So I create a lot of tutorials. Um, and the one one thing that I found is that Snapchat. I don't know whether it is because of the policy is so strict. I don't. Maybe there are some tutorials, but I find out that Spark AR. There are tons of people create tutorials, so I can learn so much from the community、uh, on Facebook and also、uh, on YouTube and Lens Studio. I don't know. I I joined there.、Um, Facebook community and there's not many people share something. It feels like, I don't know, like not many people share the tips. Got、um, it. That's one. And then、mm-hmm. another one is、um, Lens Studio. You probably, if you want to cut, like they are too customized, right?、Um, it's for people who don't really know anything. But if you want to customize something, you need、uh, to be an expert. And like, you、I、need、see. to be. There's no middle. You're either、yeah. a beginner or expert, but no middle. Yeah. So yeah. So and、uh, as because I am not good at 3D, but there、um, the whole file needs to be 4 MB. So、mm. I create a really happy bird like dancing. That was like, too big. There's like a three. Yeah. Yeah, it's like more than four MB. So that's why I was so frustrated, and yeah, and then the the polygon size, yeah. So I think Facebook is much more friendly, and once you published, because nearly everyone has Instagram or Facebook,、yeah. so nearly everyone can see it. And Snapchat is probably more like limited to young generation. And、yeah. then if you want to put like a three D model in, you have to. 
know how to reduce the polygon and texture size. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks for that overview. I've only used uh, Spark AR, so that was uh, uh, really interesting. Yeah, be before we had another podcast to like, uh, you know, Foundry 6, and then I think, uh, do you know Frank Shi? Like those two are, they, they are the master of mm -hmm. one, one company's master in uh, Snapchat. Like mm -hmm. they are even Lens Studio partner. Yeah, they, okay. they, they, are, they, they are the expert for uh, Lens Studio. Another one is for uh, the master in uh, Spark AR. So uh -huh. we have two, they were fighting and well. see which one, <laughs> which one you want better. to. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Uh, any other questions? We still have around 10, 10, 10 or so yeah. minutes. Or anyone, anyone else want to share a project? Let's yeah. see, we're getting a long question here. Just me. Uh, I can't tell if I'm only one off of the uh, microphone or not. Um, also, my internet's very slow, so it's probably going to be a, a drawn out, really whale speech uh, internet. But um, yeah, well, so we do not have a, I do not have a project in progression, but a lot of thinking about dancing, in particular partner dancing in the virtual world because it's super, I think both, both of us, in particular, Brigitte is like, you know, she's deep in the dance world, like super deep, so deep that when it's a virtual pandemic, it's like, uh, it's world breaking. You know? So how do you continue to deliver this type of content? And yeah, Zoom is kind of tough to teach, uh, teach true dance. So, so what the, <laughs> what the best, uh, right? So in, in, in my thoughts, I've played around some with the Oculus Quest and, uh, even their little um, tutorial, I don't know, the first steps tutorial, you like dance yep. with a little robot. That's robot and, like, yeah. Actually, yeah. Until, until you realize that he's not really, really, really like uh, responding to your movements. He's got yeah. one of three choices, whatever. So part of, you know, part of my fascination is like, how, how much more sensitive can we make that, right? And, and can two people with headsets, oh, learn dance online, Steezy. Nice, so Steezy, I think I was looking at something similar, but, so, so I have seen a, a friend has a, a project where you can, you can dance and try to copy the video on screen and it will identify your, your body vectors and kind of map them yeah. out on. Um, and so that seems, seems kind of promising if maybe two people with their own headsets were gonna dance with each other in different countries or something. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on what, what the long list of roadblocks is between uh, body sensing technology yeah. and maybe some, it. Yeah. So, so when it comes to uh, things like uh, um, uh, that you're doing in front of a 2D screen and a camera, currently the best technology that's out there is able to only do 2D pose uh, recognition. Actually, so it's not. Uh, it doesn't actually know the depth of where you are. Um, I know this because we're now trying to use this too. Um, it's called PoseNet. It's open source um, from TensorFlow. It's pretty easy to start playing around with to create your own things. But that is a, the limitation is that you're getting the, the 2D, not, not like the distances uh, in 3D. Um, and um, that if you're like using mobile and stuff, it's going to be pretty slow. Uh, so you can only get a few frames per second um, on, on that type of technology currently. Um, now, when you go into VR, the limitation is the amount of sensors. We have head and hands, right? This is what we're dealing with in Miu. We don't have feet. Um, what we are seeing that's really interesting um, is in VR chat, uh, if you're using the Vive, it does support um, other uh, sensors. The Vibe has like extra sensors that you can wear. VR chat might even support um, like uh, external suits that have pose detection um, um, markers on them. Uh, but generally VR chat has, I've been trying to break into that community of like they do mostly break dance, VR chat like break dance competitions. Um, and they seem to be pretty serious about it. It's mostly based in Asia, so it's a little bit of a hard group to break into um, if you don't speak speak the, the languages. Uh, but you're, we're seeing that. And I personally, I would try at least uh, a dance couple dance thing 
if somebody created in VR chat. Because VR chat is already like a, a, a real time, you can choose your avatar um, and is relatively like the speed of communication. You can high five people. I've tried uh, um, and one, I did one interview in VR chat and I was trying to dance with the interviewer in VR chat. So the biggest problem they have, which I think is, is a bit, I don't know why they didn't build that in and maybe we, you know, we could connect to the developers there, is giving the haptic feedback when you touch someone. Um, like in Miu, uh, when you're touching the avatar, you get a vibration. So you know where they are in space and you can follow. Um, and I think with that, you could at least and the visual sensation of where the person is, you could get um, at least, you know, the upper body things working. And VRChat isn't that bad on guessing where your feet are. It has an automatic like walking thing based on like if you're leaning forward and where you are in space. So you wouldn't be able to teach like lower leg movements or anything. Uh, but things that are, I don't know, I, I did like one tango class, you know, that's about more like the upper body um, or, or just like free flow. Um, I think that might be um, an interesting thing to play with. And I, I would, th there might in fact be already like some type of dance classes happening in VR chat. It's also like a really big community. Um, so you might be able to tap into to people in that community uh, that want to want to try this. Um, and I, VR chat is just like, you could also do this, you know, in, in Facebook's new thing or in Outspace. I just like VR chat because it's uh, the most, in some ways, crazy and open community. And they also have very, they've worked a lot on having uh, these like privacy and safety policies where you can uh, really choose and you need to like go through it it's a bit cumbersome but you can choose if you even want to let other people talk to you if you want to be blind to them if you want to see them uh, only as a robot avatar because some people have really scary avatars in there or, um, over, or so, so you can decide do you want to see the person's actual avatar or do you want to see everybody as robots that just have a little image on them so it really gives you as a as a user um, full agency on how you're experiencing the world um, I don't do they have a quest version I hope so. yeah 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 I've, I've done VR chat on quest I, I, I have um, so that's that's what I would uh, suggest to start playing around with. And you could even VR chat has you could create your own room there. So you could create you know a ballroom that has mirrors around it and your flo floors pretty easily. Um, you really just need to like download Unity. There's a few tutorials and you upload it to their site, and then you can have your own dance room. A lot of people use Patreon um, to help support that economically. Um, or you could just uh, open the room to people and like sell sell tickets or, or classes um, outside of the platform for it and give people like the uh, the link as an invite. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I, f I fully support that. I think it might be and the dancing interesting. Is, what? It's also kind of like you kind of escaped your own uh, your own body image if you're in VR dancing as an avatar. That's a whole. Oh whole yeah, and you can also do like just strain, right? Like how does it feel to dance with somebody that's huge and somebody that's tiny you can create like this strange experiments uh, you you can't and i think that would be a recommendation of how to go about it like what can we take that will actually augment the dance because we can't copy the the nuances you know of our body and the delicacies that we have we don't yet have that ability to bring that in there but there is a lot of magic and a lot of strangeness and a lot of fun games that you can't do in the real world that you can do in vr um and explore your movement that then you know later on when you go back to just dancing in the normal reality um might actually help you and a lot of this was um actually i started new uh the, this this angle after i went to a full week workshop with a, a dancer called uh, shira yaziv she's pretty uh, well known in the bay area and super amazing and she teaches a lot with visual imagery 
she would literally say, imagine you have a tail uh, and like follow the tail, where's the tail taking you in space? Or have us like jump through imaginary hoops and all these things that really use uh, the visual imagery. And I was just like, wait, I can actually do that in VR and show people um, these things that she's telling us to imagine. Um, so yeah, so I think that would be the, the sort of uh, really, I, like I would come to a class like that, especially a pandemic, right? So if you ever do that, let me know. I'm, I'm ha happy to assist more uh, offline or afterwards. Cool. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, maybe, yeah, one last question and then- Yeah, uh, last uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I guess two people have a question, so when it comes to the okay. last questions, I don't okay, know. Okay, we can do two. We can do two. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I probably already know the answer to this, but I was going to give it a shot since it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of research psychologically in this field quite yet. Um, my question is, especially in regards to VR work and empathy, uh, when it comes to sociopathy, uh, the, the, the neural pathways to empathy does not actually exist in the sociopath brain. So therefore, I can't imagine uh, the relatability between an avatar or any other aspect other than trying to gauge them at an intellectual level as you would try to explain it to a computer would be very useful. Is there any work in regards to how to maybe possibly use VR to start sparking or reconnecting uh, uh, the, uh, the pathways uh, to start reaching people of sociopathy, especially in children, before they become to the adult, where they become exceptionally manipulative, sophistic sophisticated in manipulation to fake empathy and then manipulate others uh, as a groundwork be before they become leaders in society. Etc. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So um, the research I know about, like sociopathy, is um, uh, what the, the, the sort of behavioral research that they do to identify this is uh, putting a very, uh, for instance, frightening or triggering image, uh, and then either me measuring both brain active activation or measuring uh, do people retreat or 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 do they stand their ground uh, and and go forward and not uh, relate to this fear factor. That's one thing that I, I know, uh, sort of how, how uh, neuroscience diagnoses um, these traits. Um, I don't know of any research that's happening currently uh, uh, to try to, you know, reconnect uh, um, people that don't feel uh, um, uh, this type of a fear, this type of empathy to others. Um, my sort of best guess around these things is that it, there are also dissociative mechanisms that are happening inside that person themselves. And that if a person is fully uh, connected to their own body and what their, their kind of up sensations are, are sort of coming up, um, that might help uh, with then connecting them to others. I think uh, uh, a lot of the times, uh, uh, whether it's from trauma or from just uh, uh, some uh, atypical brains have an over sensation that comes from the senses and that they need to like block it off. Um, so possibly an angle of like first uh, a healthy internal connection to yourself and your own body might help and then uh, being able to create these networks towards others. But I don't know of any research around that. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sarah. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, yeah, it's Miriam. We talked before. Yeah, yeah. I have a feeling like I, I want to talk to you about using um, a MU in a Unity project, but since we only have one minute, maybe we can talk later today. Yeah, we can talk later yeah, today. Yeah. But thanks for this. Um, this was awesome. Thank you, Dominic. Also, and I don't know. Um, I also gleaned that you made a project um, 
in VR, I think, about showing how the brain works on psychedelics. I don't know if you want to close with that. I'd love to hear. Uh, yeah, so I'll close with uh, not a little bit I can share about that, but also close with um, some resources that people can post. And I can share, we can send out, uh, um, uh, Dominique hopefully has your uh, emails and we can share all the links uh, and the presentation with you so you can reference it and, and look at the references later. Um, but you can download all of that view is totally free. Uh, the experience you're talking about, yeah, we just finished it. Um, it explains in a very interactive and immersive way what psychedelics do to the brain. Um, uh, currently, unfortunately, it's not open to the public. It's We made this for a client and it's going to be uh, we need to see what they want to do with this. Do they want to put this on the stores? Um, it is currently also uh, not for the Quest, so we need to morph it for the Quest um, to get it uh, possibly be on side quest. I doubt Oculus will ever let us on their store for anything. Um, so, uh, yeah, if people have, I am, uh, we, we basically finished test user testing today. Uh, but if people do want to experience it and have either a Rift or like a Quest but with a link cable to a gaming computer, um, we, I might be able to set that up. Um, and maybe just like I want to, yes, end with I am also crowdfunding still currently. Um, so if you want to actually own part of Radix Motion and get um, equity in it, um, I'd love to have uh, the people who actually own the company be people that are aligned to what we're building um, and care about the future of human communication and how to build healthy tech. So that's part of why I'm crowd crowdfunding. And uh, you can go to our WeFunder and learn more about that. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you have a great day, and do, do some stretches after this lecture, and feel free to reach out to me with any questions, and uh, Miriam, you, we can uh, email about uh, talking later today. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've already posted uh, the, uh, the way that you can connect with Sarah uh, through LinkedIn and uh, yeah. all the conf uh, inf I can information. Post, uh, I'll post the link now, maybe that might be the easiest way uh, into the chat yeah. for um, people who want to just uh, get, the, oops, yep, uh, get the presentation, copy paste this b before you leave because then <laughs> we'll make all of this disappear. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I will post on the Discord. If you want to join our Discord, you can uh, go can go here yeah I, I i storage everything <laughs> in the discord so oh, if you great. want you to can also save the chat by um pressing on the oh. three dots next oh. to five. oh yeah it's a save chat Thanks. oh wow i didn't know that yeah. <laughs> good to know yeah cool yeah yeah. yeah okay thank you everyone thank you sarah and then Bye. yeah i will see you next time Bye bye